Well, I think that uh, elect ensemble is pretty good. I'm sure you agree? And can't, uh, can't wait until we have the full choir up here, all 40, 45 uh, members. I don't know when that day will come, but we sure, do, we sure do thank our musicians for their exceptional ministry among us. Turn to Psalm 22. We're back to summer in the Psalms, our study uh, this summer. Summer's almost over, isn't it? And we haven't made it very far, but uh, perhaps, perhaps we'll return again next summer and pick up where we have uh, left off uh, this summer. Psalm 22, uh, written by uh, King David during a time, a very difficult time in his life, uh, a time of exceptional grief and anguish and uh, pain and uh, isolation. And unfortunately, we don't know the precise historical context uh, that precipitated the writing of Psalm 22, but we do know that uh, our Lord Jesus Christ adopted it as his very own during his time of uh, anguish on the cross. Let's pray, and we'll look at it together. Father, we would rather have Jesus than silver or gold or riches untold. We thank you that you spared not your own son for us, that you gave him to us so, so freely for such unworthy sinners. And we pray that this morning you would help us see him afresh, see his uh, sacrifice, see his love, see his anguish, and understand the great cost that was required for our everlasting salvation. We're glad that your word never returns void. And so may your spirit be our preacher. Lead us into truth. Uh, show us the gospel. Show us the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God our Father. In whose name we pray, amen. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? O oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer, and by night, but I find no rest. Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. In you, our fathers trusted, they trusted, and you delivered them. To you they cried and were rescued, and you they trusted and were not put to shame. But I am a worm and not a man, scorned by mankind and despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They make mouths at me. They wag their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, for he delights in him. Yet you are he who took me from the womb. You made me trust you at my mother's breasts. On you was I cast from my birth, and from my mother's womb you have been my God. Be not far from me, for trouble is near and there is none to help. Many bulls encompass me, strong bulls of Bashan surround me. They open wide their mouths at me like a ravening and roaring lion. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within my breast. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of death. For dogs encompass me, a company of evildoers encircles me. They have pierced my hands and feet. I can count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. But you, O Lord, do not be far off. O you, my help, come quickly to my aid. Deliver my soul from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dog. Save me from the mouth of the lion. You have rescued me from the horns of the wild oxen. I will tell of your name to my brothers in the midst of the congregation. I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you offspring of Jacob, glorify him and stand in awe of him. All you offspring of Israel. For he has not despised or abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, and he has not hidden his face from him, but has heard when he cried to him. 
From you comes my praise in the great congregation. My vows I will perform before, the, before those who fear him. The afflicted shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him shall praise the Lord. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. And all the families of the nations shall worship before you. For kingship belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. All the prosperous of the earth eat and worship. Before him shall bow all who go down to the dust, even the one who could not keep himself alive. Posterity shall serve him. It shall be told of the Lord to the coming generation. They shall come and proclaim his righteousness to a people yet unborn that he has done it. Amen. All flesh is grass, and all its loveliness is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, and the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Amen. Robert Louis Stevenson went to church one morning, and when he went home that afternoon, he wrote in his diary these words, went to church today and was not greatly depressed. Apparently, he often went to church and often went home greatly depressed. And so, for Robert Louis Stevenson, a, a good service was one where he went to church and went home happy. He didn't go home depressed. You ever go home depressed after my sermons? <laughs> don't answer that question. <laughs> we don't want you going home depressed. Believe it or not, some years ago, one, uh, one, uh, one of my friends and a fellow church member told me that after a certain preacher, who shall not be named, uh, preached, uh, that he had to go home and have a few drinks in order to, uh, to feel better. Well, I don't want to drive you to drinking or send you home to press, so we're going to begin where the psalm ends, that he has done it. Thank you. You don't know what I'm going to talk about, but you are, you're already on board. That's good. They shall come and proclaim his righteousness to a people yet unborn that he has done it. This is what's called a messianic psalm. A psalm that, uh, as I said earlier, the Lord adopted for his own uh, during his time on the cross. A psalm that foreshadowed the crucifixion itself even though it was written centuries earlier. What has the Lord done? He's brought righteousness to you and me. The imputed righteousness, his imputed righteousness has been given to us, a people yet unborn, as, as David uh, uh, wrote these words. For God made him who knew no sin to be sin, that we might be the, what? Righteousness of God in Christ. For in Christ a righteousness has been revealed that is from faith to faith. He's done it. Now, these last four words are, I think, critical to understanding uh, the, the psalm and must be viewed, in fact, in a broader context. In fact, you can go all the way back to the third chapter of Genesis. What did Adam and Eve do? On that day that changed human history, when Adam and Eve decided that one commandment was one too many, when Adam and Eve decided that paradise was not quite good enough, when Adam and Eve disobeyed God and brought themselves and all their posterity into an estate of sin and misery, as the Catechism says, God showed up, remember, later in the day, in the cool of the day. God came along, and he said to Adam and Eve, what have you done? Technically, it was, what is this that you have done? Ouch. I never liked it when my parents pulled me aside and said, Jimmy, I used to be Jimmy, Jimmy, what have you done? Because something terrible usually was about to follow that was far more terrible than whatever I had done that 
precipitated the question in the first place. Did you see the Lion King? Do you remember when Uncle Scar looked at poor little Simba and said, what have you done? And put all the blame upon the poor little lion for all the terrible things, uh, the misery that was about to follow. What have you done? What did Adam and Eve do? What have we done? Pilate, we, uh, Heath read it earlier. John 18, there stood Jesus, crowds clamoring for his execution. Pilate didn't really want to execute him. He found no guilt in him. He washed his hands of it. His wife told him to have nothing to do with that righteous man. And Pilate looked at Jesus and said, what have you done? Why are these crowds all stirred up? These are your people. They're supposed to be on your side in essence. Why, why, why do they want to crucify you? What have you done? What had he done? Jesus showed remarkable restraint on that particular occasion. He could have given a very, very, very long answer to what he had done. But what we have here is, is a remarkable evidence of the inspiration of Scripture. Because while David was writing these words about his own anguish, he was also foreshadowing or forespeaking of the greater David who would come centuries after him and what he had done to reverse what Adam and Eve had done and what you and I have done as well. He brought righteousness. He made his people right with God. He died for our sins and he rose for our justification and he destroyed sin and he destroyed guilt and he destroyed death and he destroyed the devil himself. But it wasn't easy. It wasn't easy at all. And you have a picture of how hard it was. It's enough to depress us when we really think about it. If you've read C.S. Lewis's classic work, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, <clears throat> you may remember that episode where the three little children are asking the big lion, Aslan, who represents Christ, what can be done for their little brother Edmund? Because Edmund had had essentially given himself over to the wicked witch. And he had become a traitor. And Aslan replied and said, all shall be done, but it may be harder than you think. So much harder than any of us can begin to fathom. Martin Luther once said, no man feared death like this man. Not because he was weak, not because he was cowardly, but no man ever bore the wrath of God for the sins of the world. So notice, first of all, the pitiful man. My God, verse 1, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? Oh, my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer by night, but I find no rest David was suffering emotionally, just as Jesus suffered emotionally. It was one thing for Peter to deny him and another thing for Judas to betray him, but something altogether different for his very own father to forsake him. Jesus had always enjoyed unbroken fellowship with his father. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. That word is the Lord Jesus Christ. He was with God. The preposition means he was with and he was toward. He was face to face. The Father's sh uh, face always shone on the Lord Jesus Christ until those dark moments on the cross. Literally dark moments on the cross. Why wasn't the Father answering? Why had he abandoned his own son? He had always helped historically. Verse 4, and you our fathers trusted, and you delivered them. To you they cried and were rescued. What's wrong with me? God's own son. Oh, I'll tell you what the problem was. 
God doesn't help worms. Poor worms. They're on their own. But I'm a worm, verse 6, and not a man, scorned by mankind, despised by the people. All who see me mock me. He saved himself. Let's, he saved others. Let's see if he can save himself. He was a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, despised and rejected by men like one from whom men hide their faces, deserted by the disciples, hated by the religious authorities. The crowds clamored for his crucifixion. Give us Barabbas. We'd rather have Barabbas than that man who healed the sick and raised the dead and cast out demons. We want a robber. Crucify that man. But I suspect all of that was nothing compared to being forsaken by his own father. So his suffering was emotional. It was also physical. And verses 14 through 18 speak of bones out of joint and incredible thirst. My tongue sticks to my jaws. Verse 15. Pierced hands and feet. Verse 16. Garments being divided, verse 18, and casting lots for his clothing. It's the language of crucifixion. And yet another evidence of the inspiration of Scripture because David knew nothing about crucifixion. Crucifixion was unknown at this time. David was writing in the 10th or 11th century B.C. Crucifixion didn't come along until the cruel Persians implemented it some 500 or more years later. Josephus, the historian, <clears throat> called crucifixion the most wretched of deaths because it gave full vent to the bloodlust of the crowds and the sadistic instincts of the executioners. And hence, the subject of crucifixion seldom surfaced in the literature of the ancient world. They didn't want to talk about it. They were ashamed of the barbarity of it. Only the dregs of society were ever crucified. And so we get a picture, do we not, of the humiliation of the Lord Jesus Christ, what he endured to bring righteousness to his people. We understand why the Apostle Paul had a real credibility problem when he said, I'm not going to preach on anything but Christ and him crucified. And I'm not going to boast in anything but the cross of Christ. Boast in the cross? It didn't make sense. The cross was a stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles. But Paul said, that's what I'm going to talk about. That's what I'm going to preach about. That's what I'm going to brag about. I wonder how many of you ladies are wearing crosses today. I see one right here. Would you wear... Uh, an electric chair, if it could make a little symbol, you know, an electric chair. They don't make that, I know, but would you wear it? Probably not. How about a hypodermic needle? <laughs> Firing squad. I and mean, that's what Paul was doing. He was boasting in a manner of execution that was utterly uh, humiliating. But here we find the psalmist speaking the language of crucifixion and setting this forth as the, what was determinative for our salvation, what was required for him to bring righteousness to us. Second, notice the pleading man. The pleading man. Verse 11, be not far from me, for trouble is near and there is none to help. Have you ever felt just overwhelmed and alone? Nobody understands. Nobody can help. So did David. So did Jesus. Verse 19 again, you, O Lord, do not be far off. O you, my help, come quickly to my aid. Some years ago, Kristen and I watched a movie called The Gray. Don't watch it. It'll depress you, drive you to drinking. 
Take my word for it. Liam Neeson, alone in the snowy, frigid Alaska wilderness, he and a few others had a little plane that went down, and he alone was left because the wolves had devoured all of his companions, and they were relentlessly pursuing him. And finally, there comes that scene where he looked toward heaven and yelled in language I cannot repeat and said, God, do something. Show me something. But there was no response. And the wolves moved closer, and the wolves encircled him. And he looked up again. He said, I need it now, not later. But there was no answer, just a cold gray sky. David doesn't speak of wolves, but he does speak of bulls. Verse 12, many bulls encompass me, strong bulls of Bashan surround me. And he speaks of dogs, verse 16, for dogs encompass me. A, a company of evildoers encircles me. Metaphorical language, he had a lot of enemies who had a terrible plan for his life. And they gloated over him. They stared at him, verse 17, just as they did at the Lord Jesus Christ. You ever felt like your prayers weren't being heard? That they weren't getting above the ceiling? We've all thought that at times, haven't we? You remember Jesus in Gethsemane when he, when he sweat blood? Perfect blood. Sinless blood. Saving blood. He said, Father, if there's any way, any other way, let this cup pass from me. And God was gracious enough to send an angel to comfort him and strengthen him. But I have an idea that the son really wanted to hear from the father with whom he had always enjoyed that unbroken fellowship. But the father didn't answer. The aforementioned C.S. Lewis was married for three years to his wife before she passed away. I believe it was cancer. And he pled with God, and he kept a journal. He wrote notes, and later these, this journal was published in a book called A Grief Observed. And he made mention of the fact that he'd been taught that all he had to do was call out to God, and God would show up, and God would answer. So he called, he pled, just like David was pleading and Jesus was pleading, but there was no answer. And it was as though the door was locked and bolted in his face, he said. Are you depressed yet? <laughs> it's going to get better. Hang in there. <laughs> we've had a pitiful man. We've had a pleading man. But you notice everything changes. It pivots there in verse 21. And we, we conclude by looking at this praising man. Uh, verses 21 and 22. You have rescued me from the from the horns of the wild oxen, exclamation point, and I will tell of your name to my brothers in the midst of the congregation. I will praise you. And then he calls on everybody else to do the same. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you offspring of Jacob, glorify him. God showed up. He always does. Not necessarily when we want him to. And not necessarily in the, the, the way we expect him to, but he always shows up because he said, I'll never leave you, and I'll never forsake you. And the hymn writer says, Judge not the Lord by feeble sense, but trust him for his grace, because behind a frowning providence he hides a smiling face. I should get an amen from you, Henry. Amen. Thank you. God came through. God heard, God answered, God saved, God delivered, God rescued. And therefore David said, I will praise you. And I will, I will not hide my light under a bushel. I will praise you in the midst of the congregation. I, I will declare your name and I will sing your praise. The sweet singer of Israel would be back on key again. 
and call on others to do the same. And interestingly, these very same words are applied to the Lord Jesus Christ himself in Hebrews 2, where he is portrayed as the ultimate preacher and the ultimate worship leader, not merely for the offspring of Jacob, but as we read in verse 27, all the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nation shall worship before you. Jesus will be the great preacher, and Jesus will be the great uh, worship leader, and he's going to have a mighty big congregation. Don't think small about the kingdom of God. Think big. Think all the families of the nations and all the ends of the earth, and think about a multitude no man can number from every nation, tribe, people, and language who once upon a time had great reason to be depressed and almost driven to drink, but found something better, and who collectively say, I will tell of your name to my brothers. I'll be an evangelist. I'll be a proclaimer in the midst of the congregation. I will praise you. Oh, a worldwide celebration. What a transformation. From such darkness to light, from death to life, from sorrow to laughter, because God always shows up. He always does rescue his people. You may feel very alone, very isolated, very surrounded. God is there behind a frowning providence. He hides a smiling face. And at the end of the age, there'll be far more than a thousand tongues singing the Lord's praise. And it most certainly will not be depressing. You ever tried to encourage the preacher? I heard a story about a, about a uh, sweet old lady, and that was kind of her calling in life was to encourage a preacher. And they had a fairly new minister and, uh, frankly, just wasn't really good. But every Sunday she tried to say something to lift his spirits. And on this particular Sunday she, she did it again, but it just didn't come out quite right. And she went up to him and she grabbed him by the, by the cheek like she was prone to do. And she said, young man, every one of your sermons is better than the next one. <laughs> oh, well. Every one of Jesus' sermons will be better than the next one. And I think they'll be long because he's got a lot to talk about. What has he done? Where do we begin? You know how the Apostle John answers that question, what has he done? The last verse of the Gospel of John. Now there are also many other things that Jesus did were every one of them to be written I suppose that the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. Amen. Father, <clears throat> we're thankful that we have all eternity to hear your Son lead us in worship and, and uh, proclaim your glories. We, we're thankful we have forever to learn of all that you've done for us and, and to delight in it, how you've answered us, how you've saved us, how you've preserved us from depression. And with David, we acknowledge that we will sing your praise and tell of your great name for all eternity. To the glory of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, through Christ our Savior we pray. Amen. <clears throat>